Hello ladies and gents, chicos chicas, don't forget the ultimate intro. Uh, we are back to refuting unsound gambits. Once again, emphasis, I'm not wanting to pick battles. I'm not treading on anybody's toes, at least not intentionally. In fact, I'm going to go very, very upfront and forward here. I know that this is one of the pat lines of Eric Rosen. And uh, I really do like Eric. He's an awesome dude. I'm not having a go at him. But let's deal with the Stafford Gambit. Hopefully I can do both, not tread on anybody's toes and still be honest about this uh, opening, which uh, I'm going to present to you now in not to how to play, but how to play against it. So, the Stafford Gambit occurs after knight f3, knight f6 takes, knight c6, knight takes, pawn takes. And before I go into the refutation of this whole anti-variation, which by the way is rather simple, and one of the greatest problems with this is that it has multiple lines, really and honestly multiple lines, where white just does splendidly well. I need to tell you a little story. When I decided to make this series um, of how to refute unsound gambits, this was the very first one that was in my head that I need to make a video about this. And when this idea was born, literally an hour later, I went onto Twitter and I saw a grandmaster, I believe from Israel he is, but I will have to check my facts on that, called Eugene Perlstein or Perlstein, I don't know, or Perlstein, I never know how to pronounce these names. Um, sorry, uh, Eugene, if I mispronounced your name. He's a very cool dude and he regularly tweets fun things, fun facts, uh, um, cool bits and bobs about chess, really, really cool dude. And he said that he's about to make a video, I think he said too, about how to refute this gambit. I went like, oh, dang it, that was what I was, want uh, what I was going to do. And he said, the key move is H3. And by the time I read the tweet, I also looked up what I was going to make uh, or say in the video back then i have actually updated that a little bit and i'm like well that's interesting you said that because i have come to a different conclusion and after that i quickly had a look and i actually couldn't locate his h3 ideas and i didn't quite see where it would come to play and now before i decided to record this i analyzed the line a little bit and i found i believe his h3 idea so here we go i actually don't even know if he has a channel, let alone if he posted anything about this. So I may be doubling up on something now, but I wanted to release this video anyway, just to have a bit of a, a clarity and so that we understand what this whole entire line is worth and how we should approach it. In my opinion, just again, to be very clear, when it comes to its worth, very little. Um, I do not recommend you to play like this as black. And I couldn't make it clearer than that. So, once again, knight f6 takes, knight c6 takes, takes. And here, the absolute insanity, and this is why computers sometimes, I feel like they are spoiling chess really for us, because the cleanest refutation of the whole entire gambit is f3, which is virtually the ugliest move in the history of the game, f3 or f6 respectively. The reason why this move is so annoying to deal with for black is, is because it secures the e secure secures. Wow, English is hard. The e4 pawn at the same time covers the g4 square, which is a very important springboard of trickeries for black in this line. There are a few variations where white quickly castles here, and then there is this h5 knight g4 sec idea, which I've seen uh, Eric pulling off a number of times. So f3. Now, there are two things that instantly come to our minds and makes us go like, whoa, that, I don't want that. Anytime we see f3, we go like, ooh, 94, and it's killing us. And this is, again, just basic pattern recognition because we know that, for example, e4, e5, knight f3, f6 is an instant losing move to knight takes e5, when after f5, queen h5 check, the upcoming checks reigning upon the black king wreck havoc and white is just winning so it's fair to think that uh oh we are dead but nothing is further from the truth knight e4 is losing to multiple moves queen e2 is just gg on your bike right away but 
it's really really cruel to actually pretend that we blunder into it and accept it then go with g3 pretending again that we blundered that but the reality is that after queen e2 there is nothing else but surrender for black because of the pin they are pissed down for nothing so knight e4 doesn't work and here comes a second very painful thing that is going to really hurt black in this line and that is that bishop c5 is always met by the ironically super crazy doozy symmetrical c3 once again super inhuman chess no one plays like this or rather thinks like this until shown by the computer but unfortunately we live in an era where if it's not wrong it's right or if it's not proven wrong by the computer rather than it's right and amazingly after c3 nothing can stop d4 and black sorry white has successfully built an unbreachable center totally totally unbreachable and behind the pawns i can easily start developing without risking anything at all and it actually highlights the greatest shortcoming of this gambit and that is that black sacrifices a central pawn and then the second central pawn takes away from the center essentially meaning that black has no chance whatsoever to even contest the center so unless his development lead instantly yields results it's just fundamentally falling apart and so if you don't mind memorizing a few lines where things look a little bit hairy at first then i recommend you go f3 go all the way f3 i think the real test here is knight h5 with the idea of making this check work but again after the very calm and measured g3 black doesn't have enough simply does not have enough Bishop G, uh, Bishop out, you just develop and D4 is going to come in a timely fashion. In fact, D4, he can't be a bad move. Indeed, one of the best. And that's it. Once you do conquer the center like this and then you develop your pieces to appropriate squares, it's smooth sailing. Black only develops some counter chances if we start off with this D3 move, which, by the way, is also very good. So that's another playable move. But once once again, I insist that F3 is definitely uh, raining very hard on Black's party. Um, and uh, once again, if what I have shown you seems insufficient, or if I haven't covered the line that you think is interesting, by all means, uh, put it on your analysis board and you will find out. Bishop E6 is recommended by the computer. And here D4 is actually not top move. Perhaps now this take is a bit annoying. Yes, and even if I do play this, you can see in the eval that even this is not good enough for black. But here I might have to go g3 first to completely destroy this check. And once again, look at that, bishop c5, c3. And it looks very scary, I will give you that, because we have no development whatsoever. And so you really need to respect black's army here even though we have the center and it looks like black doesn't have immediate threats, but you must respect it. But the respecting means that you look at it, you calculate all the aggressive moves, and there is nothing black can do with his beautifully centralized and rather developed army because the white pawns are dominating the middle. And again, best move is bishop b6. I mean, how sad is that? And after d4, it's just it. And we are done. And again, this is a very sad case and a very typical phenomenon in chess where you reach a position where you're quite happy with what you have and you still have in your mind moves that improve the quality of your position. Whereas black has reached maximum potential and it's very hard to see from here on how this trend can continue for them that they are ahead of development so now they would like to strike but they can't and so the tendency will be that they play something uh and um it's just not going to happen for them like now i'm catching up in development amazingly by the way a4 is the best move here Look at that line, a4, a5, b3. I mean, what is not the most ironic and cynical thing to say to refute a gambit than to play one, two, three, four, five, six ball moves in a row? That's surreal, but I wouldn't play like that. This is the moment when you need to start developing. But I would like to also refer to Eugene's line because I found out, I believe I did find out what he meant in his somewhat um, code lingo. 
I think in this position you can play knight c3, which usually responded by bishop c5. Usually black wants to utilize this diagonal, this square, to somehow hurt me on f2. And here h3 is, I think, a very, very playable move. And I think that this is what Eugene must have meant, because the idea here is that after queen d4, I have queen f3. And if they develop, I develop and bishop e3 is going to trade. I'm going to castle here. And again, the central pawns create an unbreachable barrier that black just can't combat at all. If bishop e6, the engine's favorite move was for a while queen e2, which I really dislike. I just, get, I just like d3. And here very often you find that the idea is to actually oppose this bishop by playing bishop e3 or benefiting from the ugly h3, which normally I would never ever recommend, but then again, I would normally never ever recommend f3 either, but we are not in a normal case. So now we benefit from h3 because if they go queen e7, we can do queen f3 and again offer the trade and tuck the king away. Either choice is super easy, super solid and guarantees you an almost winning position right out of the opening. So this is how you deal with the Stafford Gambit. Once again, I don't want to sound very negative about it or here comes the wet blanket again who tells you how everything is bad. None of that is my intention. Uh, I claim to want to be an educational channel. I always have. And I think that the absolute core of learning about anything is to learn out, to learn values. What's something worth. It's very important for us to understand because if the Stafford Gambit falls under the same category with the Botvinnik variation of the Semislav, then we don't really understand what's going on in chess. And so here it is. Here is my take on how you tackle this. It's always fun to throw in something like the Stafford when you are playing a casual game. And for that purpose, it's really awesome. But I would definitely not recommend it if you are about to play a serious game where there is rating points at stake, you want to improve, you want to defeat someone who is higher rated than you. So when things get serious, this is not the way to play. And hopefully this video will explain exactly why. And if your opponents play it against you, you will hopefully now know what to do. Thanks for watching and I'll be back with more soon. Bye.